Hey. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Gabe Garcia. I'm a senior at this high school. Um, happy St. Patrick's Day. Um, okay, so I want to start this out with everybody closing their eyes real quick. I'll just shut them. Okay, now I want you to think back to when you were a child, when your parents would talk to you lovingly, when they would su support you, influence you in any way. Now I want you to open your eyes. So there's plenty of good times with your parents, right? There's plenty of bad times. <laughs> <laughs> now I want you guys to think, did any of you guys have the kind of parents that I had that would have murdered you for getting a tattoo without their permission? <laughs> My TED Talk has an agenda, and that agenda is to shift your views of tattoo from a neutral or negative perception to a positive view. I want to tell you how you may have gained stigma and how tattoo has become such a large part of our society and personal lives. So although this will be a history lesson, please stay attentive. <laughs> As some of you may know, or well, for my question I chose, how has tattoo transformed from its original form in indigenous culture to the form it takes on currently in Western culture? And how has this affected the meaning behind, behind the practice? Some of you may know, I'm very passionate about my artwork. Um, and my, my interest derived from the commonness of tattoo and how often, <laughs> that's me. <laughs> <laughs> How often you see tattoos everywhere in all kinds of aspects of society, but we'll get back to that near the end of the presentation. In 2015, a Pew Research Center poll said that nearly 40% of the entire population has at least one tattoo or body-like modification. That could mean scarification, dermals, which is a type of piercing, or just tattoos that aren't recognized by the tattoo industry, like UV ink, which glows in sunlight. Now. How did tattoo become so popular? Tattoo has gone through so many different types of evolution and had to adapt to the times. It's gone through stigmas, judgments, and several different types of challenges. Tattoo hasn't always been so widely accepted, nor has it been negatively perceived, and that's what I'll be explaining today. Indigenous culture, like Samoan, Osage, Omaha, and Aztec, practice tattoo even though geographically none of them are even close to near each other. Um, the one thing that they did have in common was the tattoo, which in most cultures meant where you stand in your, in your culture or in your uh, society. So that could mean wars won, politics, protection. Uh, tattoos were thought to intimidate enemies, grant power, protect pregnant women's uh, fetuses from deformities and death. Um, right here you can see a warrior who has dark lines on his nose and chin, which would just mean that he's a warrior, but he was very successful, hence all the lines ranging back to his ears. Um, and this man here you can tell is a chief with just the medallion on his neck, but also the large eyebrow tattoos and the circular designs on his cheekbones. This white woman here, which I found in some of my research, she was captured by natives. Um, and turned into a slave, hence the five tattoo lines on her chin. But the two lines that go outward on each end of her chin mean that somebody found her attractive and married her, which probably is the reason why she has no scarification or any, any bodily harm, and she's in a nice dress. Um, and, this <laughs> woman, <laughs> and this woman here has um, protection spells all over her stomach. Now you may be thinking that that's a lot of power for somebody to tattoo somebody and have them believe that they're either a slave or they're protected or they're powerful, and you'd be completely correct. In these kind of societies, tattoo artist meant being at the highest position of either priesthood, you had to be connected to the gods in some way, you had to be a chief, making being a tattoo artist a very exclusive position. So those are some of them. <laughs> Um, we've come a long way since, since using bone, small rock, ash, or different types of berry to apply ink into people's skin. Um, and there you can see a small bit of bone um, sharpened and you would smack that stick onto that stick into somebody's back or arm or anywhere else. Um, and this was great for people's health that we transformed from that type because <laughs> it was so dangerous with the different types of bacteria and parasites you can find in certain types of like berry juices or muds. Um, 
but the spirituality was completely destroyed and the <laughs> and the meaning behind tattoo was kind of left from its very respected like area of perception to a more gross connotation when it was discovered by Europeans, specifically British Europeans. And now I'd like you to remember one very important man to the tattoo culture, um, Sir Joseph Banks, a British European who, was disco who discovered the indigenous styles of tattoo on his first voyage between 1768 and 1771. Um, he's so important to the world or to the tattoo world because of his journal that he wrote named The Endeavor. Um, in his journal, he said, and I quote, what could be a sufficient inducement to suffer so much pain is difficult to say. Not one Indian, though I asked hundreds, would ever give me the least reason for it. He continues to say, possibly superstition may have something to do with it. Nothing else, in my opinion, could be sufficient cause for so apparently an absurd custom. Now you may be thinking, absurd is exactly how I would describe tattoo. <laughs> Especially my mother would definitely say that as well. <laughs> but she, along with you, are wrong in my opinion. <laughs> absurd meaning illogical or contrary to all common sense. Um, this just means that Banks didn't have tattoo in his culture, which means he couldn't understand it, leaving it illogical to him. And so it had no negative connotation on it. And he was very important to that world, but the rest of the Western world didn't appreciate tattoo at all. This man, uh, sorry, <laughs> Captain Cook, um, he sounds like a serial, but <laughs> he was the captain of Banks, and on his second voyage in 1774, brought back two Tahitians named Omai and Tupi. That's Omai and that's Tupi. Um, they were used as guides and language interpreters, um, an extra crew, but when entering into, oops, <laughs> when entering into <laughs> England, um, they were sorely mistaken on what they would be used for. They were seen as objects and, pers and portrayed in pubs or museums, and people would just come and watch them. Um, at least that is according to one of my best sources, Dr. Uh, Margot de Mello. One of, uh, <laughs> she works at the Can Canisius College and is the director of human studies. Um, obviously, this kind of trade made, sl or this kind of action made sla uh, slavery quite the trade. And as another very reliable source, source, Audrey Porcella says in her article, Tattoos of Marked History, she says Europeans were fascinated with the exotic and eagerly paid money to see tattooed attractions, making the capture and display of tattooed natives an extremely lucrative business. Now, tattoo is still frowned upon by the upper class, which made the middle class very, very perceptible to it. And so the middle class became almost the guinea pig for the upper class. Um, but as people became more accustomed to seeing tattoo, the rich started to become more fascinated. And so even though beyond social norms, the rich, or tattoo became solely a practice for the wealthy. And this was for two reasons. Time, which you don't have when you work in a factory, and money when you're getting minimum wage that is much lower than what we have today. Travel, women slept with, and culture absorbed became the marks of the wealthy. This of course brought several different styles of tattoo into our culture, like Japanese, which you can see with very colorful lines, bright flowers and geishas, which are simple-faced women, which per is perceived as beautiful in Japanese culture. Black and gray, which there's one main rule of black and gray, you never use white. You only use black and then water it down until you mix, mix with gray. And then of course, one of the longest surviving types of tattoo, tribal. And tribal in its simplicity is beautiful, but also in its complexity when you put the designs together. Now there's one more type of tattoo that was in this era. Um, and it was one of the most important, um, this is most, yeah, it was just most important, <laughs> American traditional. Um, American traditional arrived in the US and revolutionized the art. Um, 1891, Samuel O'Reilly created the first electric tattoo machine. That's what it looked like. Um, and it was created after Thomas Edison's perforating pen. Um, tattoo was now fast and cheap, just the way Americans like it. But <laughs> um, 
<laughs> Availability to the lower class meant that the wealthy no longer saw it as representing novelty or high status, which mean, meant total abandonment of the entire art. So now that tattoo didn't represent any of those things, it reverted back to the association with the primitive. But luckily for us, we have wars. <laughs> so, the association with veterans and tattoos um, totally revived the art. Uh, the patriotic tattoo, which usually meant a tough man, um, led to positive light um, for tattoo because of the positive light shed on veterans. Um, but don't be mistaken, even with the introduction of the 20th century, tattoos still held a strong stigma, and the biggest sign was women. Tattoo was dirty, vulgar, and it would destroy a woman with an upscale image. In Victorian age, this was true, and commonly, refusal from a tattoo artist, or refusal from a tattoo artist was common for women, um, because they wanted to keep them as nice girls, which of course meant attractive, middle-class, heterosexual women. Um, tattoo would only grant a woman transgression from the class and the sexual borders of the time, uh, which would turn them into tramps, which I don't call them that, but that's, <laughs> she just looks like more fun anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Although tattoos still transgressive and gross, everyone loves a show, right? Whew. The, public <laughs> the public still found tattoo to be exotic. And what do Americans do better than anyone else in the world? We capitalize. We capitalize on the odd and the different, which the circus was exactly. The circus, a relatively new practice, needed to sell tickets and tattoo people were all the rage. So foreign, tattoo attracted large crowds, making the capture of indigenous tattooed people once again a very lucrative business. And most people couldn't resist coming to see these people, which gave, or which couldn't resist to see the tattooed people and people that weren't um, socially acceptable, leading to the phrase freak show. Um, capture and display was not a very, capture and display was not a very cost effective, uh, was not a very cost effective or ethical. Um, and so employment of Westerners that were tattooed was the next phase. Um, there you go. In 1920, over 300 people completely tattooed were employed in circus and sideshows. Tattooed Westerners were now the norm inside the tent. To stay relevant, people would tattoo their entire bodies, like one man named Horace the Riddler. Or Horace Riddler. Horace Riddler, also known as the Zebra Man. Uh, he was English born, he was very rich in London and asked George Burchett, one of the most esteemed tattoo artists in London, to tattoo his entire body to stay relevant. Um, of course, this meant thick black line o all over him. Um, the circus was short but very valuable time for tattoos. Those performing were viewed as amazing and incredible, but do you think that these people were accepted outside of the tent? No, no definitely not. <laughs> The circus, in contrast to the wars and turmoil, 1940 to, 45, or to 50, the Second World War had just concluded, and regulations skyrocketed. Age limits, health inspections were implemented um, to keep away dirty needles and other health risks, which could cause hepatitis C, which can affect your liver and kill you. Um, this was when tattoo was most rejected in its history because it was cro because beyond crossing um, comfort barriers, it was also affecting the public's health. Another problem with tattoo was the deviance. Deviance was another concern because it was, or it was just a concern. Um, it was perceived that physical traits could determine one's criminal behavior. This was true in a disproved but seemingly valid experiment by Dr. Cesar Lombroso. An Italian criminologist, physicist, and founder of School of Positivist Criminology School, who was referred to as the father of criminology. And he said, Criminal criminality, an individual's pr prosperity to be a criminal, could be determined by the individual's physical attributes. The negative view of people with tattoos assuming deviance directly relates to the several subcultures of biker gangs, thugs, drug dealers, and addicts. This was great for tattoo because then it had a lot more customers. T 
tattoos economy grew. Shops became cleaner and better and containing, or, and became better at containing disease and not spreading. Um, this, these are more modern day tattoos. As I said before, a strong presence in movies, TV shows, public faces, um, like Ink Masters, um, a TV show where people fight each, not physically fight each other, but <laughs> challenge each other with each other with art, um, and the best person gets choose and wins a million dollars. Um, the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, another famous movie not even close to related to tattoo, but still part of the plot. Um, and of course, my man crush every day, <laughs> <laughs> James Hendry, who is a soccer player and ex or and a male model. The reason I love this man is because he has several different styles of tattoo, which was brought along, especially in this modern time, where not you didn't have to just wear one type of tattoo, which you'd seen through history before that. You wouldn't really move from Japanese to American traditional. He has portraits. He has new types of Japanese and geometric tattoos all over his body. Um, and it wasn't any, yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> 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 this is the, the bombardment I was referring to in the beginning. Um, and it's where I see myself ending up. And this is why I want to be covered in tattoos because you see so many people covered in them and how many different reasons and, and um, influences you can put on your body just to show people your personality, different types of yourself. So that's all I have. Thank you and happy St. Patrick's Day. Are there any questions? All right, we'll open it up to questions from the panel and from the audience. If you have a question for Gabe, please feel free to raise your hand. What would you say your style of tattoo art is and what inspired okay. um, Well, currently I'm following neo-traditional which is a mix between American traditional and portrait art. Um, and I'm following it because it's, it shows bone structure and hidden, hidden under tone. Like if you were to draw a tiger, you would be able to see the jawline of the tiger with small subtle line. And I just adore that subtle line. So that's what I did. <laughs> so Gabe, you went into a lot of detail sort of about the status symbol of tattoo in these early indigenous cultures, like where does, and then how it was sort of reviled and seen as dirty and disgusting, and like where are we at now with tattoo perceptions as far as our culture and society goes? Well, that's what I was kind of trying to show with, with how tattoos are transforming into these beautiful pieces. Um, it's no longer really about like your status, it's become more of an individual piece because in indigenous culture, um, it seemed, like in my perception of it at least, it seemed to be a lot more about the general group. Um, you're a group of warriors, you're a chief, and you've got all these subjects to care about. Um, and now it's more about um, the respect you have for your own body and your personality and how you should show, um, how you should just show yourself off. And so it's, yeah. It's Is that, are there still areas of culture where tattoos have those group significance or has that mostly gone away? It's mostly gone away, but there's definitely still bubbles of it. Like in New Zealand, there's large amounts of the revival of what's called moko, which is a different type of tribal tattoo. And it's all about connecting because when you have um, your tattoo artist tattooing you, your tattoo artist also gets that tattoo. And so you have tattoo, tattoo artists covered in, in all kinds of different, co in different lines, even overlapping each other. Um, because they are taking a community, and so that entire community is connected through the tattoo artist. Um, you talked about how you like wanted to change people's perception of tattoos. Was there anything you found throughout your research that, like, obviously you've been for them the whole time, but was there anything you found that maybe contradicted your beliefs or like, challenged you? Um, yeah, I mean, there were some things that that kind of convinced me that tattoo is sort of a it is sort of a dirty practice. <laughs> um, that was mostly in in one of my papers. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but it had to refer to the difference of tattooists and tattoo artists. Um, and the difference is that tattooists uh, they're 
uh, more in the corner of biker gangs, drug addicts. They they are in shops where people can walk in um, and get anything on their body at any time. Um, and tattoo artists are more in the fine arts culture where they have their giant paintings on the inside of galleries. They have um, very nice shops that you have to make appointments for and they make specific types of art to specific people. Um, and so I found that, oh, please say your question again, I'm sorry. Yeah, wasn't there anything throughout your research that like, contradicted or challenged your beliefs? Oh, yes, thank you. So, so I realized that even though I do want to be leaning more towards the tattoo artist spectrum, mm -hmm. that I am unfortunately on the tattooist spectrum because currently I hold the, um, the title of a scratcher. Um, <laughs> and that's a tattoo artist or someone that's become a tattoo artist who isn't in an apprenticeship any longer. Um, and has tattooed before without a mentor. Um, and so it kind of bummed me out. It kind of left me like, I'm gonna be in like this position forever. Um, and so, yeah, I thought like I might give it up for a long time, or halfway through the project, I thought like I might as well just like give up being a tattooist because it's so much work to become a tattoo artist. It's, it's just crazy hours practice. Twice. Thank you very much, Gabe. Just step outside for just a moment.